Thank you very much. And, and you, you, it was short, as you asked. <laughs> um, so I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, uh, I know that we have to go fast, because otherwise we'll be thrown out. So I've already cut 15 slides of my talk. And that will make things easier. So um, I was thinking about a way to begin this talk. And um, I came up with the following, which is the first time I begin to talk this way. And it's the following. Uh, in the beginning, it was not the word. It was not the number. I added this after the film on touring. Uh, it was not even the idea. It was action and then feeling. So I think now we are in the right place. And I think that that's probably the place you want to be. Um, number two, I have been unable uh, quite recently to talk about consciousness, which is something that I'm very often asked to talk about, without talking about feeling. And uh, this actually is quite different from different phases of my uh, thinking and career and uh, article writing and even book writing. And in fact, in the last book that I wrote, uh, which summarizes some of the uh, th thoughts I have about the problem, uh, I came closer to the position that I'm going to give you today, but even that is not terribly updated. It's a book called Self Comes to Mind, uh, which for the francophone is actually L'autre moi-même. Only the French can come up with a title like that. Um, uh, but it's not a bad title in the end. Uh, so the purpose of my talk is to discuss what we know about feelings, about specifically the neural substrates of feeling, um, at a systems level and in humans, although it will be quite clear that what I'm going to say uh, is, of course, coming mostly from our work, which is in humans, um, both humans with uh, brain damage as well as normal humans studied with functional imaging, but it is actually quite applicable to non-humans, and it is very, very strongly informed by what we know about uh, neural systems in a variety of other species. And I think that we're perfectly authorized, justified to do that, provided especially those uh, other species share quite a lot of what we share in terms of two things. One, uh, certain structures of the nervous system, certain functions that they clearly have, and one in particular which has to do with life regulation or homeostasis. Uh, and that's exactly where we're going to start, which, which is with the concept of homeostasis. And whether we talk about life regulation or survival or homeostasis, I think we're going to be on the same page. And um, what I would like to tell you, if it's there, no, it's not yet, uh, is that homeostasis has, of course, a variety of goals, and we can sort of compress them into the following. Uh, immediate life regulation, Integ maintenance of the integrity of the soma, the continuation of the species, obviously, and social regulation. And of course, I've added social regulation, and I'm going to emphasize it because very often people don't see it as part of homeostasis, but I don't see how you cannot, uh, and it doesn't, you don't need to be talking only about humans. In fact, you can even go down all the way into invertebrates, and you still have to talk about social regulation if you're going to talk about uh, homeostasis. So those are fundamental aspects that uh, help creatures uh, survive uh, and adjust uh, themselves to an environment so that life is possible. And it's not just life possible uh, in a way that will sort of barely let them escape uh, from death. It's in all likelihood, at least now taken from the human perspective, life possible with a certain degree of well-being attached to it. I'm not aware of any human being that would want to maintain homeostasis at some kind of mythical neutral level. We want homeostasis maintained at a level in which you can describe physiological conditions that are compatible with the notion of well-being, which of course is a notion that you can also define uh, introspectively. So, um, the goals of homeostasis, I, I'm looking at my slide and I'm seeing that there are too many slides on the screen. 
Uh, anyway, I think we'll manage. Uh, the goals of homeostasis are implemented via action programs. And this is a very important point and one that is very often uh, not, not even considered, is that you don't implement action, you don't implement homeostasis via some kind of mysterious way, or you don't implement homeostasis, uh, or at least doesn't make much sense to talk about it in terms, for example, of uh, molecules that you are using or not using at a particular point. I think that you have something that you can describe quite clearly, which are action programs, and those action programs are, in fact, solving very very complex problems with standard but elaborate responses that do not require deliberation. And this is very uh, important, the idea that they are solving problems but that they do not require deliberation by the agent that is solving the problems. And here we are, of course, back into the uh, counterintuitive situation of creatures that are the result of evolution, about which Dan talked about this morning. It's very counterintuitive, but there it is. Um, next, uh, the programs are preset, you could call them innate or instinctual, but their deployment is open to learning, specifically to conditioning, and can be influenced by incentives and reinforcement. And that changes the game very clearly because we're not just talking about action programs existing in the brain of a particular living organism, but about the fact that those action programs, once the organism is in the environment, uh, can be influenced and can, can be influenced by a variety of conditions in the environment and can lead to a, a lot of learning and can even lead to some modification of the way in which those programs are deployed. Next, um, learning allows the transfer of basic goals, and this is, of course, how appetites for food, drink, sex, exploration can become appetites for money, dominance, power, and so on, and that's something that it's very important to keep in mind as we go into the next uh, point. So we're now at the point in which we can talk about homeostasis and the strategies of homeostasis. homeostasis. And the ones that I've outlined there uh, are, first of all, drives and motivations and emotions proper, emotions in the proper sense. And I want to make an immediate uh, comment here, which is that uh, the, the nomenclature uh, uh, wars about what you call these action programs is, of course, uh, very large and very varied. And uh, I not interested at all in those wars. If somebody wants to call all of these things, like for example, uh, thirst uh, and hunger and air hunger and pain and sex, emotions, fine with me, I don't have any problem, and there are people that will want to do so and do so. If somebody wants to call them homeostatic actions, fine with me too, I think it's a bit pedantic, but that's fine, we can, we can, the only thing that we need to do is agree that there are homeostatic actions and that there are certain strategies that brains of and organisms of every kind along the scale, and again, we can even go down to invertebrates, uh, utilize with great success all the time and that certainly we humans utilize with uh, great success. So. I mentioned thirst, hunger, hunger, air, uh, hunger, which is something that people very often don't think about, but it's quite important. I mean, if we would uh, increase the content of CO2 in this room and we would reduce proportionately the amount of oxygen, you would very easily begin a situation of panic uh, and you would, in fact, struggle to get more air. And that's a very uh, important strategy to keep uh, alive as much as having thirst uh, and you know, maintaining your sodium balance or having hunger and maintaining your uh, energy supply. Um, but in addition to all those appetites for food and drink and sex, uh, there's pain, absolutely critical. You cannot survive without this ability to have nociception, to 
uh, register signals that indicate that somewhere in your body something has gone astray and you have the possibility of having the nature of pain given to you and the localization of pain given to you as well, which is very important. And then you have other things that are on the list there uh, that are not trivial, such as uh, exploration as a strategy, play, care of progeny, uh, attachment to mates, uh, all of which are absolutely essential strategically in order to maintain homeostasis. And then we would move to what we call, uh, like to call emotions proper, which include such things as disgust, fear and panic, anger, sadness and grief, joy and happiness, embarrassment and shame, contempt, pride, compassion and admiration. And as you can see there, I'm going from the very trivial to the sublime, uh, and I'm doing it leaving out tons of emotions that I could mention, not only in terms of their verbal descriptor, but in terms of their very nature. The list is far longer than that, and yet that list gives you the idea that I'm trying to capture, is that in addition to some strategies that are extremely basic, extremely simple, and that are indeed shared by the majority of creatures living on Earth, there are also some that are shared by some of those creatures, but are not by all. Uh, for example, uh, you know, it would be extremely difficult, although one can make that case, that non-humans have a sense of admiration or a sense of compassion. In fact, the case has been made for a few mammals. Um, but I'm not going to go there. I just want to indicate that there is a, a, a very long line of homeostatic actions that are presented in concert and that are extremely regulatory and they all fall into this camp. They're given to the brains of organisms by the genome. They are probably tuned in childhood and they need to be tuned in childhood, but fundamentally they're there available to all of us, human and non-human. And moving right along, uh, the states of activity related to homeostasis, and here we get into the heart of the topic, are experienced as feelings. So I want to sort of notice that uh, when we talk about feelings in general, uh, certainly in our context biologically, we're not talking about only of feelings of emotions. We're talking about feelings of all these things that I uh, described and that are homeostatic strategies. So you have feelings of pain and you have feelings of hunger and you have feelings of uh, thirst and on and on all the way along the scale of those emotions and other emotions. And the point is that once you have those collections of actions that we call homeostatic, we have the possibility of gaining experience, and this comes, unless your brain is not functioning right, this comes automatically on the heels of the action program. Um, and, uh, of course, this applies to all of the states that uh, precede the deployment of homeostatic actions, including imbalances, uh, intentions of action, expectations, and to the states resulting from the correction of the imbalances. So, uh, you, uh, for example, you uh, have a variety of states that are related to thirst and can precede thirst, uh, and that are related to, for example, the intention to drink water and search for water. Uh, and you experience that as particular feelings, and you can describe them. Uh, and you also then have the feeling that results from the correction of that state. Once, uh, and of course, all of that state, let's take thirst, uh, is, uh, is entirely being commanded by different proportions of availability of sodium in in the blood and uh, the uh, the kind of osmolality that you have in the blood and one and there are sensors for those particular uh, variables that are in fact it's quite well known, contained in the medial wall of the hypothalamus, and it's quite important because if you damage that medial wall, you actually don't feel thirst, but you have 
once the correction is made extremely rapidly, uh, the, the sense of thirst disappears, so the feeling goes, and the feeling comes that, that gives you the sense that that need was relieved, the same way that you have the feeling of satiation once your hunger uh, is satisfied. So, uh, to give it some kind of uh, uh, structure in terms of the essentials of this homeostatic machinery, let me say that you have competent stimuli. stimuli. I like to use this term. I began by using it in connection with emotions, so it was emotionally competent stimuli, but it's more general than that because it's not just about emotions. You have competent stimuli. The competent stimuli consist of changes in the neural environment, and they can be internal, such as deviations from the homeostatic range, take the sodium example, or external, an object or a situation. And the interesting thing is that when they're external, the object doesn't actually need to be in the environment, can be in your mind. You can, for example, recall an episode that was extremely unpleasant uh, to you and feel angry about that particular episode. You, you don't need to have the situation or the person that caused anger in, in, uh, in front of you at that moment. You can recall that particular object. But that object is, and the situation, are the competent stimuli. And then you have a situation of triggering or inducing uh, the uh, response, and that uh, happens in certain neural interfaces. And it, I think one of the jobs of neuroscience is actually, in this particular model, looking for the platforms for such things as the appreciation of the competent stimuli, the kind of neural interface that can be used in the brain, and there are many, sometimes for even the same condition, in order to lead to the next step, which is the execution of the homeostatic action, which in a lot of the cases, as we now realize, is being and is under the control of another platform. So one of the interesting things uh, is that as you study more these systems and you get some differentiation, you realize that there are certain regions that are very devoted to appreciating the presence of a stimulus and reason, uh, regions that are, uh, intervene in the control and regions that uh, will serve as the execution site. And the more complicated the stuff, the more this is likely to occur. Uh, and, uh, for example, we, we, we know that this happens already at the level of something as simple as air, air hunger, but will happen even more as we go towards the emotions. So how do the homeostatic actions achieve their management goals? Very simple. They modify the internal state of the organism, obviously. They modify the behavior of the organism. And they modify the mind of the organism. And this is obviously something that we are authorized to speak about because we're humans and we study humans that can tell us what they feel. But you can presume it quite reasonably for a variety of other species. And to bring home the point, I will use the example of the action program of fear. And this could be ex made extremely complicated, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you what we have there. The action program of fear will have some preparatory actions, for example, on the heart, on the lungs, on the gut. Uh, you will, uh, your heart will race, your uh, uh, lungs will be operating at a different speed, and the rib cage uh, is bringing on the right oxygen that you need. Uh, there is, for example, if the fear situation involves an immediate danger and the necessity to uh, flee from the scene of the source of danger, you have analgesia that is in being induced so that if you uh, start running, you will actually not feel pain. And this is, of course, not something that anybody engineered that way, but Darwinian, in Darwinian terms, this was very beautifully engineered over time. Uh, and you have such things as, for example, the secretion of cortisol. Uh, so there's this, the best way of describing this is a concert. Uh, you have many actions that are happening within the same, the same time unit, but they are like musical instruments playing along a particular score, and they're doing different things in the same units of time, although the overall unit of time is going to be the same, which is the time that runs from the beginning of the concert to the end. Um, and 
in addition, you have certain specific behaviors such as freezing or uh, flight, uh, attentional behaviors that bring on saliency in terms of the causative object, uh, and specific modes, uh, specific cognitive modes and strategies, again, something that we can talk about in humans very freely, because we do know that, for example, if you are in fear and you are uh, you suddenly decide to either stay absolutely uh, immobile or take flight, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to start thinking, for example, about the, the merits of Bach oratorios uh, or some other beautiful uh, thing that you like in the world, like a particular painting or a particular person. You think about that situation. So there is a, a way in which the cognitive mode changes, and it changes not at your will, it changes because the situation calls for it, and it's part of that very complicated response. Okay, so now let us get into the meat of things, which is the meat of feelings. I think we went one too far. So let me see if I give you a description that uh, gives you, uh, I, I know that uh, uh, Stephen uh, is very kind to the notion of feeling, uh, which I very much appreciate, but I'm not quite sure that he believes that the problem can be solved. So I'm trying to give you some ideas at least of the direction in which the problem can be solved, although I wouldn't claim that it has been solved. So let me give you a description and see if this helps. Point number one, F feelings are mental states associated with specific brain states. Uh, this is a very interesting sentence. You could write this in many different ways. But what I really want to say is that they are neural states, but they have a mental aspect. We cannot deny that mental aspect, but it so happens that I'm not a dualist, and I think that that mental aspect is entirely tied to specifications of the neural process, some of which I cannot get into the details of. Uh, Dan was talking this morning about something like, it is something like, but it is that something like that is happening in a particular kind of neural network and neural system at a particular point. Point number two is probably the most important point that I'm going to bring out this afternoon, or maybe not the most important, one of the. Uh, the mental contents of feelings correspond to descriptions of aspects of body states. Now, uh, quite frankly, I've not seen this described in so many words, although plenty of people have been circling this idea, beginning with William James, and probably even before that, certainly William James uh, uh, was would be very happy with this notion. But this is actually much richer than what James said, much richer than what most people give it credit for, uh, is that the contents where whatever you do when you describe a feeling, if you're being serious and complete, as complete as you can, about the description, you realize that the contents are descriptions of either a particular organ state or a particular system state, or combinations thereof. Uh, and all of that, there's nothing that I can imagine that you can do when you describe a feeling that does not relate in one way or another with the body. And this is very important because it gives you a way of entering the logic of the system and of trying to understand what are the limits of the system and what it can possibly serve and how you can possibly use it. Okay, next, homeostasis, which we started the talk with, requires sensing of body states. That's what the whole thing is about, right? You cannot run homeostatic programs if you don't have sensing of the state of the body because you would not know what to do. Reading, the organism would not know what to do, which really means the organism would not have the automatic, automated programs that will know what to do not knowing in the most general sense. Uh, and next, sensing, and this is important too, is achieved by mapping ongoing body states in sensory platforms within the central nervous system. Uh, and so you, you, you have the contents, you have the fact that this is needed, this is not something that somebody uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, capriciously added to the system, and you know that there is a way neurally to implement uh, this, 
the sensing of body states, which is by virtue of maps that are in sensory platforms within the central nervous system. And let me just make one uh, comment. Uh, the minute people read platform in sensory systems, they have the unfortunate tendency to think about the cerebral cortex because that's easily the thing that people most talk about when they talk about the brain because that has been the thing that people most know about. Uh, well, sensory platforms are not only in the cerebral cortex and I'll give you some evidence for that as we go. Let's see what comes next. Next comes just a very quick slide to give you an idea that there are ways of getting the information from the body to the platforms of the central nervous system. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this because it requires a little bit of knowledge of anatomy. But I can tell you that everything that is marked in that darker yellow or orange corresponds to uh, both chemical and neural uh, processing of a variety of information that comes from the internal milieu and from the entire organism and that, lo and behold, ends up inside the brain uh, through the system which we should call interceptive system uh, transmitted either by molecules that bathe certain regions of the central nervous system in the circumventricular organs, namely in one organ known as the area postrema, uh, or are transmitted via fibers. There are C and A delta fibers, and those fibers, including the ones that go into the vagus nerve, are dedicated channels for the transmission of this information. So there's nothing casual about this, and nothing then can be or not be. It is like this. And it is like this that this kind of information that will lead to the construction of body maps is transmitted by fibers that are very well characterized and, by the way, even have a very notorious characteristic is that they are largely unmyelinated and they, are largely, they largely have been kept for a very long time in evolution with that strange uh, and counterintuitive characteristic of lack of myelin. Okay? So, there they are. And, next, okay. What we designate as feelings corresponds to the experience of mapped body states. And feelings, and this is a very, another very important point in this talk, feelings add a new layer of homeostatic control. And this is something that is very important because you might say, oh, okay, this is interesting. You, you have maps that generate feelings and you could have them or not have them and you would still be able to organize the machine. And the answer to that is a resolute no, that it would be possible to have platforms in the neural system that will regulate certain states quite well and do so without feeling, but in the majority of circumstances in which we humans, for example, are caught, and not just humans but many other species, if you don't have feeling, you're not going to be very effective. And in fact, the growth of the regulatory processes, especially as they connect with a social setting which is indispensable, is not going to be effective at all. So that a new layer of homeostatic control is not there to add or not to add depending on what you like. It's there because it's important, it's needed, and if anybody asks, well, are feelings good for anything, let me tell you that they are. And the particular point that I want to make is, comes next, which is that because body states are necessarily valenced, what do I mean by this? I mean that body states are either good for life or bad for life or something in between. Feelings are automatic proxies of biological state and natural guides of behavior. Now, it's a lot to bite into that, but I believe this very strongly and I think this is the main point to be made, is that when you have feelings, you don't have feelings about things that you could care or not care. The fundamental feelings and the way they evolve are about things that are vital for survival. And if those feelings are out of tune, then murder are, is out of tune, like Hamlet would have it, and you are out of tune and die. So the valence, the power of those feelings, 
in expressing what is going well or wrong in the machine is absolutely decisive. That's why they are important. Okay? So, next point is what about the neural basis of feelings? And I will, so that I can tell you a little bit about what we know at this point of the systems that are involved in representing uh, those so important valence uh, states. And I will begin with the case for the insular cortex for very obvious reasons. I was very interested in insular cortex. In the 1990s, uh, we, we, we thought that this was it. If we would study the insular cortex, we probably would be able to understand how feelings were going to be processed at systems level. And we were actually largely on the right track because the insular cortex is, in fact, very important. Uh, we also knew that there were other structures in the brain that were involved in representing uh, body states, so it couldn't be the insular cortex alone, but still this had the weight uh, of the, the, the representation, and of course the insular cortex happens to be a very, a very large structure. You're looking there at some... Are you looking there? No, you're not. What happened? Okay, so you're looking there at uh, a human insular cortex seen in transparency. It's an image that Hannah created so that you can start from the outside of the cerebral cortex and then go in all the way into the uh, full size of the insular cortex, which is normally not seen from the outside because it's totally deep in the frontal or opercula. Uh, and this is, by the way, the... the a real human brain reconstructed in 3D from magnetic resonance images. And uh, so when you look at that, you realize that this is not a small uh, territory. This is a very, very large territory with a lot of uh, uh, gyri. It's in fact a large piece of real estate uh, in, the, in the human brain. Um, and we know also looking both at the real gyri uh, on the left uh, and on the mapping of the overall structure that, of course, comes from the monkey. And in one case, it's work, actually, in both cases, it's work of Van Hoosen uh, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, Masulam and with uh, Larry Heimer. Uh, and what that shows is that this is a large territory. You know, it's, it's a very important cortex. And it's, it's strangely not been paid until quite recently a lot of attention. But especially after 2000, there have been a tremendous amount of studies, mostly involving functional imaging. We began with uh, positron emission tomography in a paper in 2000, and over the past 12 years, uh, I, you know, there have been hundreds of articles written on studies that show the insula to be quite active in a variety of situations that really cover the, 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 the waterfront. It's really sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There's nothing that does not bring the insula up in one condition uh, or another, and this is fine. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that recently uh, the, the interest in the insula was so intense that uh, some people said, well, it's actually just the insula. This is the thing. The insula in humans is very big and very important and is going to be the full source of, the, of feeling states. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, one person, and that happens to be uh, Bud Craig, said, well, it's more than that. It's, it's the only... Uh, creatures of the human variety have feelings because you need that kind of insula with that kind of organization to produce feelings. Animals will not have them. And sentience is actually going to be produced by the insula at the same time. And this was a little bit unkind to other species. So we actually decided to test this hypothesis with, with one of the oldest methods in neuroscience, which is the lesion method. And because we have in our repertory of uh, studied cases patients that have damage to the insula. We began an investigation of the hypothesis that if, in fact, the insula was this uh, be-all for uh, feelings and sentience, then uh, a devastating bilateral lesion of the insula ought to reduce the person to a non-feeling, non-sentience creature. And I have good news to tell you that that's not the case. The first study actually came out in cerebral cortex just uh, a month ago, or this month, I don't know, uh, 
uh, and let me show you. Uh, it has to do with a patient that we know as patient B. This is the first, now there are two more on the way. Um, patient B is a victim of herpes simplex, simplex encephalitis, a very well studied case of ours. And we went through the entire review of the protocol and have a few extra studies to demonstrate quite unequivocally that this patient is of course fully sentient. In fact, this patient is a, by all measures a fully conscious individual. He does have problems with memory because he doesn't have a hippocampus bilaterally. He's a sort of HM plus, which means something in Montreal. Uh, and is a patient that also has damage to uh, polar and lateral temporal cortices and some damage in the uh, medial frontal cortices. So he's not the most uh, brilliant decider and his memory beyond the memory that has to do with his fundamental self, uh, even his autobiography is a little bit um, skimpy. But the fact is that the person is fully conscious. And most importantly, this person is fully feeling. So this person has all sorts of pleasures with food uh, and displeasures with food and drink and has all sorts of pleasures and displeasures in terms of temperature, in terms of the company he keeps, is a very uh, interested individual that explores social uh, situations and if anything he's actually more focused on feeling than on anything else because his intellectual life is impoverished. So it's exactly the opposite of what you would have predicted if he were to be demolished of feelings. He is all about feeling. He's not much about intellectual abilities because although he's perfectly uh, capable to manipulate uh, symbols, he knows not enough about the world and about his past to relate it to the present and to the future. But his feeling status is absolutely uh, brilliant. And uh, just look at a few of the images. So um, I don't have a pointer here, but what we have there is a comparison brain on top and patient B. And the, the, the two rows on the bottom repeat comparison and patient B. And what you can see is that the comparison brain has the insular region uh, very marked, uh, very well marked. And in the, the second, patient B, you see this vacuum, uh, which is given by the black, that corresponds to the complete erosion of not just the insular, but actually of territories that are around it. And in the next slide, uh, let me see if we move. This is not moving. Does it move now? Yeah. And now you see it in coronal cuts, and you can continue seeing that picture. So you're you're isolating in the, with the red circles and with the dotted red, uh, the, the ovals. Uh, you can see the, the structures that are demolished. And you can see there in yellow one structure that is very well preserved, which is actually the brain stem, about which more in a second. Um, uh, this uh, patient has also preservation of the basal ganglia. Oh, that would be good. Okay. And uh, something that is happening in this patient that is also preserved is that somatosensory cortices, you have here the patient's brain and there the comparison brain, and in green you have marked the somatosensory cortices, and that is preserved. And in the next one, uh, you see uh, again that they are quite intact, and we even have S2. So you can see that even the region uh, of S2 is preserved uh, in the in patient uh, B. Um, the cingulate cortex has been involved uh, in the pro or potentially involved in the processing of feelings, especially in relation to pain. And so we looked at that. Could it be that this patient? would have some cingulate preserved, and that's not the case. And, okay, so then we move to something else, which is how are we going to explain why this patient uh, has in fact preserved uh, feelings uh, given that his insulin is all gone? And very rapidly the answer is that, number one, brainstem structures are not impaired, and I'll talk 
a, a little bit more about that because that's where I very much want to go. And number two, S2 structures are preserved as well. Now, there are plenty of reasons why S2 is not the best candidate, or even S1, to explain how you have interceptive information preserved, which it does, when in fact we know that pathways don't lead into that territory and the pathways that are interceptive and have to do with body information in terms of the viscera, in terms of abdomen and torso uh, go uh, uh, entirely to the insular cortex. But we could imagine some kind of adaptation that the patient would have undergone after the damage. But the brainstem is where we really want to uh, concentrate. So. Uh, the brainstem that I'm going to concentrate on is a territory that is in the uh, upper part of the brainstem. And for reasons, I don't have much time to go into the details, but it is after this point, this level of the brainstem in mid-pons, that the central nervous system becomes informed about literally every aspect of the body both in terms of the head and in terms of the limbs and in terms of the entire torso. Before that, you have partial representations of the body. But beyond that point, you start having whole representations of the body. And I'm very interested in anything that happens from that point up, because that is likely to be territories uh, in which you can have the whole representations that I think would be required for the kind of integrated feeling states that we're inter interested in. Uh, something that is very important is to have a notion of how you carry the information to these structures. And here in this diagram, you see how information from the trigeminal nucleus, which brings information about the head, and from the spinal cord, actually ends up in this level of the hypothalamus and brainstem uh, in structures such as the parabrachial nucleus and the nucleus tractus solitarius and the hypothalamus, and how all of this information is secondarily pushed forward to the posterior insula and anterior insula, and how there are also some direct pathways into the insula. So what you're dealing with is something very interesting that brings information about the body first to these big stations of the brainstem and then brings it also to the insula and the stations of the brainstem secondarily communicate with the insula. So uh, it would be very hard to imagine that these levels of the, the brainstem are not going to be important in order to generate the kind of uh, body information that we need for feelings. And to put just the final layer on the cake, the fact is that these structures, I'm talking about these structures here, for example, parabrachial nucleus or, um, or um, uh, uh, nucleus structure solitaries, have topographically organized maps. So what I mean by this is that it's not that they're made up of a nucleus where you have, say, a bunch of neurons put together like a bunch of grapes in a sack. Uh, what you have is a layering of the neurons in very much the same principle that you have in the cerebral cortex in which you have different regions apportioned to the cables that come from different portions of the body. That's what is meant by a topographically organized map. And this is a principle that people very often think is only in the cerebral cortex where topographic maps are galore. You see them in, the, say, the, the somatosensory cortex. You see them, of course, in visual cortices. You see them in the auditory cortex. But they're also present in the brainstem. And you have them in these very complex nuclei. And you also have them in the superior colliculi. The superior colliculi, especially when you think the, the, the superficial layers of the, uh, the superior colliculi are involved primarily with visual function. But the deep layers are involved with somatosensory uh, function, with auditory function, and with integrations of all these put together. So there's something going on in terms of arrangement of maps that is, has, of course, been going on in evolution for a long time. You, you find this in, in reptiles, for example, and it, it's there to provide a map 
that obviously has some very adaptive functions in terms of regulating uh, the, 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 the complaints that may come from a particular department uh, of the body. Okay? Uh, this is just for those of you who are aficionados of anatomy, just to give you an idea that the brainstem is not really a small potato. Uh, the brainstem has, and this is very, very simplified uh, map of fundamental nuclei in the brainstem. And this was actually done together with my then student, Josef Parvizi, and the uh, the, all the areas were, the, 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 the scale in millimeters is here, and all the areas were given the right square footage so that you see their relative proportions. And so we're talking about, again, substantial parts of the brain. The nice thing to think about is that these are parts of the brain that fundamentally you can trace down the entire phylogenetic scale. Again, go to reptiles or fish, and you will find a lot of these structures, not with as much interesting detail as we have, but the, the, the difference between them and us now in terms of brainstem is far smaller than the difference between their alleged cerebral cortices and our alleged cerebral cortices. There, there is really a huge difference. That is, of course, what allows us to have all the brilliant cognitive uh, functions we have. But this fundamental machinery is there, at least in substantial uh, ways. Let's see what comes next. And uh, you have there one diagram that I like, uh, because it gives you the proportions in for the human brain, and it gives you the positions that these structures adopt. And I have here areoposterima, nucleus tractus solitarius, parabrachial nucleus, hypothalamus, superior colliculi, and the periaqueductal gray, which I have not mentioned before, but which is one of the key partners in this. For example, you cannot have fear reactions of different kinds without having the involvement of the periaqueductal gray, which is being, which is the ex, uh, um, the execution platform that, for example, a structure such as the amygdala will use in order to deploy a particular kind of fear. And there are, in fact, different kinds of fear concerned with different columns of the um, periaqueductal gray. Uh, so this gives you an idea of this arrangement. And there's something very important in that diagram, which is the following. Uh, every one of these structures connects back to the structure that feed forward to it. So you have a very integrative, recursive way of operating, and you have the same thing happening in relation to the body proper, and the same thing happening upwards in relation to the cerebral cortex. So it's not that you have a series of nuclei that have been contacted by information from below and are simply passing on that information upward. You have structures that map it, you have structures that can transform it, and you have structures that can be transformed by influences from the side, from the top, and others from below. So a lot of the principles of operation here are not that different from the, the principles that you can have in the cerebral cortex in the relation, for example, of association cortices and primary cortices. So this is very important, and it, uh, unfortunately this has been, uh, well, first of all, it's not known most of the time, or if it's known, it's simply forgotten and neglected. So to close the story on the insula, which continues to be one of my favorite parts of the brain, uh, I would say that, you know, you could ask me, so what is the insula good for? And I would say that it provides more detailed uh, maps of feeling states than the ones you have below, for reasons that are obvious. Uh, so the, 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 there are maps in the brain stem, but this one is providing you a different arrangement of the map, and something that is very important. It is a map of feeling states that is suitable for interconnecting with other cortical maps that are related, for example, to memory, to reasoning, to language. So it's not that feelings are going to occur, quote unquote, at the, in the maps that are in the insula alone. It's that the feelings 
that occur at brainstem level and in the insula, at the level of the insula, have a better chance of being related to information from other sectors. And that information is, of course, relevant because the, the, the feeling states are then going to have an influence on the cognitive process as it is occurring at that point. So, I promised that I would finish before five and I'm almost there. Uh, and I just wanted to connect this back to the notion of sentience and to the notion of consciousness. What do I really believe in this area? Uh, I believe that the structures and the operations that I have described are the ones that are necessary to produce a state of sentience, which is a state of basal feeling that you have, provided you are alive, provided you have platforms of representation of body states, and provided the variety of other physiological conditions are met. For example, there has to be a certain degree of attention. There has to be a certain degree of tone in the overall uh, brain. There has to be enough stimulus intensity. Uh, the animal has to be awake. So this is not trivial. You have a variety of factors that have to be met along with the fact that there's a map in place. But once they're all met, I don't see any reason why you sh a, a, a particular feeling state would not emerge. Uh, and I think it is that feeling state that serves as the inaugural event of sentience. So I am saying that sentience and feeling states so defined are actually one and the same thing. I'm also saying that the first, the inaugural event for mind is this, from a point of view of evolution, is probably this same kind of process. So where mind began, as far as I can picture, was not by you seeing a color or hearing a sound. It began when you could have a mental state about the state of your own body. Okay? And this happened, of course, in creatures that probably did not have much in terms of vision or in terms of hearing, but they certainly had a body and they certainly had to run an homeostatic program on that body. So I will put together the beginning of sentience, the beginning of mind, the beginning of feeling on the same plane. Okay, so where does this leave us in terms of all the other things that many of us are interested in, if you're interested in consciousness, and that I have been interested in and have done work on and written about, like, for example, the notion of self, uh, the notion even of autobiographical self. Well, the basic idea that I have is that without the sentience level that I've just described, forget it. You're not going to have all the other levels of self. So if I would call this something, I would see if I have, yeah. So I would say that there are at least these three stages of self to consider, a state of proto-self, a state of core self, and an autobiographical self. And that first stage of uh, proto-self, this is actually a very old slide, um, uh, old by, say, a year or two. Uh, so th this proto-self is a neural description of relatively stable aspects of the organism. And what I mean by stable, it doesn't mean that it is neutral or it doesn't mean that it's the same all the time. Is stable in the sense that it only varies within a narrow compass, which is the narrow compass that is compatible with life. So you can be exceedingly happy, quote unquote, or ex exceedingly sick, and in pain, and those are the variations that are allowable in that fundamental state that I describe as compatible with the stable description of the organism. And the main product of the proto-self is a collection of spontaneous feelings of the living body, and I've called that primordial feelings. I can't guarantee that I will call them that forever, but that's what I call them today. And those fundamental feelings are really the rock bottom of what we call sentience and of what we call a conscious individual, okay? Uh, then there's a, that second stage. Uh, let's see, need to move this. Uh, do you have the core self there? Yeah, okay. So for core self, 
Um, I'm not even sure that I would agree with all the words here, but let's say that the core self is generated in pulse form. And the pulse of core self is generated when the proto-self is modified actively, obviously this is all involving action, by an interaction between the organism and an object, and when, as a result, the images of the object are also modified. And so the relation between organism and object is described then in a narrative sequence of images, some of which are feelings. And then you have the more complex level, which is the autobiographical self. And the autobiographical self occurs when objects in one's biography, such as you know, all the memories we have about what happened to us at different times in our life, generate pulses of core self, which are subsequently momentarily linked in a very large scale coherent pattern. And everything that we hold dear as human beings in terms of uh, reasoning, creating, uh, our operations with language, uh, the operations that lead you to, for example, mathematical manipulation, all of that occurs in the setting of this very large scale consciousness that is part of our autobiographical self. Uh, and of course this, I can speak about that for a long time, uh, I can just tell you that there are for those of you who may be unhappy with my insistence on the brainstem, this is something that we certainly require the cerebral cortex for. Not only that, we require a partnership between a, a, a very large set of regions of the cerebral cortex uh, that are key points of convergence and divergence and that are in, in of themselves fairly abstract uh, um, circuitry and that have the power to operate back and forward to sensory portals such as the visual cortex, the auditory cortex, the somatosensory cortex, and so on. And these regions are to be found uh, both in, in the mesial and the uh, lateral wall of the cerebral cortex. You have them in the frontal cortex, extremely important uh, hubs, so to speak, in the temporal lobe, uh, of course, in the parietal region, and um, also in the medial aspect, you have these several regions. One that is especially dear to me has to do with the posterior medial cortices, which is probably of a slightly higher hierarchy and probably runs herd over many of these other regions in certain circumstances. So there you have a very large edifice, which I don't think we share with many other species. I mean, we certainly share them with uh, other primates and a few others, but certainly not at the scale that we have. And what permitted the development of our high reasoning powers or uh, of mathematical manipulation or of uh, uh, language certainly came out of this particular set and has nothing much to do with the brainstem. Now, the interesting thing is that you could have this, you know, till you're blue in the face, but if you do not have the apparatus of the brainstem operating to deliver to you primordial feeling states, you do not have life regulation, and I don't think you're going to have sentience. And it is no coincidence, uh, neurological coincidence that is, that the states that demolish our consciousness are first and foremost states that are related to precisely the regions of the brain stem that I've talked about as the important ones in order to build this system. Uh, it's quite interesting historically that so much of this story could have been available if the lead that came out of studies of reticular formation in mid 20th century had been followed, but it wasn't. And this happens all the time in science. For example, the lead of William James was lost. And it was lost for a variety of interesting historical reasons. You know, for example, absolutely stupid disputes, uh, even after uh, James were, well, was dead, that did not allow that series of studies to be continued in a modern framework. And the opportunity to understand emotion and feeling actually was lost very early on because that lead was not followed. And the lead into the brainstem was completely lost 
because the entire set of studies that actually happened in Italy and in California uh, during the hate day of, for example, uh, Magoon, uh, were not followed. And then we went into the cerebral cortex. Uh, and, you know, this happens all the time, and I think it's time to redress this balance because we have a lot to learn from that. And my final comment on feeling is this. You could say, well, uh, isn't it the case that you have not talked about feelings in relation, for example, to colors or sounds? For example, I love music. I spend a lot of my time listening to music. And uh, uh, obviously, I have feelings when, I, when I'm listening to music. And then certain composers and certain instruments that I prefer exactly because I know that I have predictable kinds of feeling with them. So what about feelings caused by music? Are they in the cortex? And what I would like to say is the following. I see feeling systems as truly the ones that bring information that has to do with the body, period. Nothing else is feeling. That's what we're talking about. What you do is that you can juxtapose in your beautiful cerebral cortices the feeling states that you have coming from your fundamental organism, from your body, you can juxtapose that in time to the processing of beautiful sounds or beautiful images from landscapes or paintings or people that you love. And you love them when their representation visually evokes through a mechanism of competent stimulus, a feeling state. You don't have the feeling in the picture of your beloved. You have the feeling because the picture of your beloved conjures up the making of the emotion, which is action, which then becomes feeling because that's representation of the darn thing in wherever it gets represented at brainstem level and at cortex level. Okay, that's it. Thank you.